yes, uh, hello. Hello. I'm Liz Shannon Miller. I'm a TV editor over at IndieWire.com, and I believe you know this gentleman as Ray and also the creator of Archer at and Reed. Hello. Thank you for coming. And so I believe what we are going to do now is we are going to show you the season six premiere, which you would only get to see normally if you were in January and also in America. If you were from the future. Yes. And in America. So we apologize if you are from the future and also America uh, for having to show you something you've already seen. But you know, for the rest of you. We have so many questions. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, everyone enjoy. Are people still here? Hooray. And you said it wasn't that funny. That one had a lot more feels than normal. Yeah, it had a really, that really sweet moment at the end. With yeah. A, with a perfect... I think they're growing up. They are. Well, that's actually something I find really interesting about the show, to kind of jump into it, in, is that, you know, re-watching it, you know, you, it's, you know, of course you, the jokes are always there right away, right off the top. And then, but then the more you watch it, the more you get into it. And you get, it, I, I found myself like, re, you know, especially during season five, like, oh, Pam and Archer are having a nice moment. And that's not exactly the sort of like character, you, you don't expect to have the kind, those kind of feels over characters in a show like this one. I think that's all, that's all from FX um, and their direction from, from day one has been, um, they really want it to be about characters and, and the characters' relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. And I came from Adult Swim where they, you know, it was totally different. They were like, why can't a giant owl walk through here? <laughs> and I did that for like 10 years, and so I was pretty good on knowing when to bring in the giant owl, but I'd never really written anything character-driven. Uh, so it was really a hard, hard transition to make. What, what, what was the toughest part about it? Well, the show's twice as long, so it's like a ton of work <laughs> now. Um, but just... Uh, Fewer episodes? No, the same amount. We do 13 a year, and okay. we used to do 13 11-minute shows at um, Adult Swim a year. Um, do you get paid twice the money now? It's the same amount. It's the same amount. I've got a terrible agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was, uh, it's, I guess it's been hard to know the balance between you know, the feels and, and the funny. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody told me, you know, Early on, you know, comedy has to have drama in it or else it's not funny. So there's always inherently some drama in there, and I never really, I, I don't think, realized that. Is there, are there episodes that you look at and you feel, oh, we really hit, hit it there, we hit the perfect never, balance? Never, never. No, that, that is so painful watching that with a bunch of people because I'm like, that was, I could have done better. Done better. Um, no, it's, it's hard to watch. It's hard for, to for, watch. for you as the creator? Yeah. Well, is because it, I just watch the bad stuff, you know. Oh. The stuff that you will, only you would notice. Yeah, like when I look at my eyebrows, I don't think those are looking pretty good. I think <laughs> that is a mess. Do you have then someone else whose job it is to watch it for you and be like, no, it's actually okay. You did a good job this Everybody's time. Everybody's job is to tell me it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> just from top to bottom. There's a huge you know, studio of people that tell me it's great. Um, FX. You know, we, we have a very good relationship, um, and uh, our, our main exec that we work with at FX, a woman named Kate Lambert, has been with us since we pitched the show. And normally, um, at FX, they hand you off once your show goes to series from the development execs to the current execs, but we've stayed with Kate the whole time. And so, normally, I think you just get to work with an, uh, a development exec for like six months, but we've been with Kate for six years. So, um, I know now what Kate wants, Mm -hmm. and we keep Kate happy, or try to keep Kate happy. Um, and I was telling somebody earlier, the network notes from FX um, are great. Yeah. And the only thing more frustrating than bad notes is good notes. Because then you, you can't just go, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, well, you have to go, that's actually a great point, and I'm gonna go rewrite the script now. Yeah, I bet Kate has some good stories about her time on Archer. Well, yeah, we, it's, it's a pretty good show. You know, we have a good time together. I think uh, it's a fun show to work on. Have there ever been any, any moments where you, like, wanted to try something and they pulled you back? We had in episode two, um, they go to Germany or Switzerland, and they're uh, 
is a young woman who's hitting on Archer uh, furiously. Mm -hmm. And I, Wikipedia is like, so the screenwriter program in Wikipedia. <laughs> and I spend an inordinate amount of time like looking up what car would they be driving or just time waster. Um, and I researched and found that the um, age of consent in Germany is 14. Mm -hmm. So in the script, this girl is 14 years old. Even though nothing <laughs> happens between Archer and this teenager, she was 14, and that, the phone rang right when they got the script. Um, and the standards and practices lady said, she is not 14. And I was like, hey, look it up. That's the age of consent in Germany. She goes, that's great. This is not the age of consent on FX. <laughs> And that was pretty early on in our relationship, and I was still like, you know, I don't know, feeling my oats or whatever. And I was like, no, non-negotiable. They're like, well, of course it's negotiable. It's our channel. And <laughs> so they were like, make her 18, and I was like, 18 isn't funny. And so I think we settled on 16. Um, but that was a, that was one of the, like very few pushbacks. And then one thing that they just said, absolutely not. I think also in episode two, Archer was in the script, he threw a baby to disarm a gunman. <laughs> like a newborn infant. And they were just like, nope. <laughs> and I was like, well, let me do it. They're like, nope, we don't throw babies here. <laughs> Which is fair. I mean, I guess. I, I just, I, I, we're learning important lessons, so you, you're not allowed to throw babies on FX, and the age of consent is 16. Yeah. That's really helpful. So from, so from the beginning, like, I mean, talking about the research that you do and you put into doing on the show, that's actually fascinating because, of course, the show, as we just saw, is very deliberately of its own time, in its own little world that draws on historical events, but, you know, is not, if you tried to actually match it up with reality, it wouldn't really match Would up. Would not match all. up. Yeah. Would not match up, unless they just have a terrible IT guy who's like, these are the big clunky computers we need. And we did that uh, consciously very early on um, with the, the animators and illustrators. We sat down and said, you know, what is y'all's favorite, favorite cars, favorite clothes, favorite interior design? And I think Mad Men had just come out. So everybody was like, you know, this looks amazing. Let's rip that off straight away <laughs> and copy that style in the clothes and make him look like Don Draper. And then we'll just give him cell phones and we're done. And the cell phones is just a laziness thing so they don't have to go find a phone booth. <laughs> it just makes it easier as a writer if you can text or call somebody on your cell phone. So is it something that kind of just from the very beginning has been a very organic development? Like you just, when the episode calls for it, you're like, ah, oh, Turkmenistan. Yeah. Or, or what, you know, we had a, a joke about Dane Cook early on. Um, and it, it, yeah, we break our own rules all the time. We're, or I'm terrible at keeping track of any of it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, is that, is that almost part of the appeal of it, though, for people? I don't know about for people. For, for me, it is. <laughs> um, and one of our producers, Casey Willis, um, a lot of his job has turned out to be, hey, you know, you killed this person in season four, and now you've written this episode about him. And I do that all the time, and especially when Ray was getting paralyzed. And that <laughs> I would have him in a wheelchair. They'd be like, did something happen that we don't know about? And I'm like... No, what? Is he? Oh, he's walking now. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> just, just don't draw the wheelchair. <laughs> so now we have both. So it's easier to switch back and forth. Between parallel. Wheelchair and Ray and walking around Ray. That's like, and I, I'm, it's, <laughs> I, it's funny you bring up Ray. I Because I, I have this, he's such a fascinating character. And I feel like one of the things I'm fascinated by is the fact that he was the one you chose to voice. Yeah, he wasn't supposed to be in the show, really. Um, it was just this one episode, I think also in, episode or in season two it was when we peaked obviously all the best episodes are from then um and we were just like we were like lying on the floor in the office and i was trying to come up with a script idea and for some reason we started laughing about m is for Ma m as in mancy mm -hmm. which just slayed me and then i was like i want to write a whole episode leading up to that one joke <laughs> How can we use it? And then somebody's like, what about a bomb? And then somebody else was like, and put the bomb on a blimp. It writes itself. So that then we needed somebody to talk to on the phone, and everybody else was on the blimp. So we needed a character. So he was just going to be a one-off thing. But then Kate liked him, and then here he is now, being paralyzed every season. <laughs> what did Kate like about him? I don't know. 
I don't know. Maybe his vest. He used to wear a little white vest. Um, and then he turned out just slowly to be like probably the best human being there. I think he and Pam are like the two people that you would think, yeah, no, this is my friend. Everybody else you would not be friends with in real life probably. You brought up Pam, and I want to make sure we get to this. You, you brought a special clip from, of, of, of featuring Pam. A, 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 a Pam featurette, um, which we made, I, I think, for the DVD that's coming out. Um, and, yeah, do you want to show that now? So I mean, we, we so can we get wait. To it? What do you guys think? It's very short. It's only six frames, so you're not even going to see it. I'm just diving on the chance to talk about Pam more. Well, yeah, we happening. can watch that and then talk about Pam. Let's talk about Pam after we watch okay. that. We obviously have our soapbox. <laughs> You're st standing up for important issues. R yeah, but rarely. It's, it's, it's a, we never do that. Just the one. Just, Just the one. This is we're, the one issue you've taken We're coming on. out hard against the FDA. <laughs> Y'all have a, what's your version of the FDA? Is it the, the, the Canadian version? I'm yeah. not Canadian. I'm, Where are you from? I'm from America. Where in America? Los Angeles. Born and raised? No. This is not <laughs> on your list of stuff. Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I do, I do not know. The, uh, the first question has to be the answer to what's the Canadian equivalent to the FDA. What do you have here? We have like a dairy control board. <laughs> is there one for all? We have the Food and Drug Administration, so they do everything yes. from heart medicine to yeah. Health Canada? Yeah. Food Inspection Agency, are they a reputable outfit? Or are they? They're not doing a very good job. Okay. Oh, so, so, so. Do you guys keep banning or, or sorry? Uh, we ban your beef? <laughs> oh, dear God. Yikes. <laughs> well. They let some let them might happen here. Uh, we did too, I think. Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. The, the important thing is that Canada and the United States are united in having terrible, terrible food regulation issues. <laughs> we did it, everyone. <laughs> Yay. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to derail you. Oh yeah, so let's talk about Pam. Okay, yes. Well, actually, what I'm uh, the, the and I think that Pam is actually a really great example of one another thing about Archer that I think makes it stand out from other cartoons, which it's calling it a cartoon almost feels weird. That's what we call it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, the thing is that it's something I think that the show does really well is, you know, Lisa Simpson has been the same shape for the last twenty five years. But you have characters who undergo extreme body transfor tra transformations on a regular basis. And I know that's hell on an animator. My original plan was they wore different clothes every episode, just like real life. And my business partner, Matt, was like, we're not doing that. <laughs> that's ridiculous. So the compromise was like, Lana has the same, basically, sweater dress, but it changes colors. Yeah. And even that, every he's just like, money out the door. <laughs> But you win that fight occasionally, and especially last season where Pam has a, has, undergoes a significant weight loss, and yes. Lana's also pregnant. That was our pro-cocaine soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> also, the FDA, I think, had something to do with that. I don't know. Probably. I, mean, I making... think they regulate the cocaine. Like, dentists have it. <laughs> like Dennis? You, yeah. Like, I think dentists, right? You can just, like, if oh, you're no a dentist. Cocaine. No, they have cocaine, too, though, right? Or they used to. I don't know. Like, don't in, know. like in the twenties? No, like I think dentists have a, like a box of cocaine at their office. <laughs> for what? I don't know. For for uh, like numb you out or whatever. I don't know. I mean, are there any dentists here? <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, for cauterization. That's what that's what dentists use cocaine for. I'm learning a lot today. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Okay, sorry, Pam. Pam. Yes, cartoons. But, but, so, cartoons. So, so talk about the process, though, of like working with animators to say, look, we're going to have this character, you know, both characters. We, we're going to have this character, Pam. She has looked this way for three, se three four seasons. We're now going to change her. She's going to have a completely different body design. Meanwhile, and then, and even more gradually on Lana's side, you have her, you know. Slowly getting pregnant. Slowly getting pregnant and pregnant her. Yeah, um, that's normally just... Uh, Anything like that is such a short description in the script. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, note, uh, Lana's going to slowly get pregnant over the course of the season, and that's the last I think about it, and then somebody has to make that happen. Or, note, uh, Pam is going to eventually, you know, look like a scarecrow because of her cocaine addiction. Please make that happen. Mm -hmm. And then that just leads, like, a bunch of people have to stay late and work on the weekends. Mm -hmm. 
and then my business partner hates me. <laughs> but is it something where you're seeing like vari variations on the design and then approving or approving one? Yes, of yes. Is, but does, does, did it happen on a per, for last season, did it happen on a per episode basis? Yeah, yeah, it was like, uh, you know, here's, actually they did kind of beforehand, this is gonna be the stages of Lana's pregnancy and then here's some rough sketches, this is Pam's descent into cocaine addiction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. So, I mean, in general, what has kept you at animation for over a decade now? Um, it's been so long since I've worked in live action, I don't know anything about it anymore. And I, a big part is I don't think anybody would let me do live action because I don't know what I'm doing, even <laughs> less than this. So, and it's a pre, you know, like a, any TV show, it, they cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And some company has to go like, yeah, we'll give you millions of dollars and we kind of trust you to not waste it. <laughs> um, and I've heard some pretty horrible yet great stories about here's the money up front or whatever. Like FX was like, yeah, we don't do that anymore <laughs> because a couple of guys really just blew the money and then they're like, here's your product. Um, so the contract initially, they're very, very long and they keep saying over and over, I think the phrase is like a, an A-class product that mm -hmm. you have to turn in. Like they have like their acceptable levels and you can't just turn in some crap or they'll come get you. Um, yeah, I think it's it's people now trust us not to waste their money <laughs> making cartoons, but I don't think people would trust me to make live action. I certainly wouldn't. What would you do if you had the opportunity? To do live action? Yeah. Hmm. I, I think this would be fun, live action. We'd, <laughs> we'd get to go a lot of places. Yeah, the, 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 the me mechanized farms of America. Yeah, or yeah. Or space. Or space. But it, would be, it would be cost prohibitive, I think, to do this show live action. Well, Archer certainly. I mean. Yeah, John Benjamin is not handsome enough to pull that off <laughs> at all. And he'd be the first to tell you. You'd have to you'd have to cast John Hamm, but then lip sync him the whole time. Exactly. And I think a lot of I love listening to John talk and um, have been a huge fan of his forever. And when we were uh, pitching him to FX as the lead for Archer, they had a, like some really big name drama actors that they wanted us to think about. And we kept saying, John Benjamin, John Benjamin. They're like, no, nah, he's like the Dr. Katz guy. No, it's gotta be suave guy. So we actually took audio of John from home movies when he was Coach McGurk, mm -hmm. drunkenly telling these kids about a dead body. And we had already drawn Archer, so Archer's standing there with a martini in his beautiful suit. Hey kids, you wanna come see a dead body? <laughs> and we sent him that and they were like, yeah, great, lock him down. That's perfect. <laughs> Um, because he's, his voice is, I love it so much. It is, it is amazing. It sounds like it should be coming out of Archer. Yes, yes. Uh, it was hard for me, the first season of Bob's Burgers, I was like, that just, it's not right. <laughs> but uh, I'm a huge fan of Bob's now. Well, I imagine. And you guys paid tribute to it in no show. Yeah, that was fun. They were, uh, Lauren Bouchard, the creator of Bob's Burgers, was so cool about that. And I was like, hey, we'd like to do this thing. I'm going to send you the script. He's like, don't send me the script, that's ridiculous. I'm sure it's gonna be fine. <laughs> uh, but then we did send him the episode just to double make sure, and he was like, it's fine, it's fine. I mean, it's good advertising for his show. I don't think it hurts. Yeah. I don't think it hurts. And then we got to, you know, slap commercials all over Bob's Burgers, and they have like 50 times more viewers than we do, so it was a win-win, much more of a win for us, I think, than for Lauren. Do you think there's any chance they'd go that you'd, you'd get paid back? Would they give in, do a do an Archer episode? <laughs> I was. What I would really like to spend a whole season with the whole Archer, like like we did with the cocaine episode, but they all work in like an Applebee's together. <laughs> and like Mallory's the manager and Archer's the bartender, and I think it'd be great. I'm the only one who thinks that. <laughs> I've pitched that to F I pitch it every year. I'm like, what about a restaurant? And it's just click. I mean, is that something you think about for future seasons uh, in terms of like, we can do it, especially having done Archer Vice, like you've proven that you can do a season that's just completely outside of what you originally established. We were going to come back for season six and they were all gonna be in prison for the whole season. <laughs> so Orange is the New Black, but Yes, with well that was, there were two drawbacks. One was how, we, how can we plausibly make a co-ed <laughs> prison make sense? 
And then Orange is the New Black had just exploded, oh. and the, we didn't want to be like, yeah, we have a present show, too. <laughs> so actually, really, the main reason we didn't do it, because we could have figured out some stupid lie about, oh, no, it's co-ed prison. It's a thing now. Um, I feel like but super- Orange is the New Black success ruined it for everybody else. Now nobody can have a prison show. No one else can do a prison show no, now. No, not ever. Uh, but yeah, we, they were going to be like factions, and then Mallory you know, is going to be running her cell block, and then they have like the enemy... <laughs> You know, whatever the white supremacist gang that they're always beefing with. I think though, you I think Orange is the New Black proves that you can get an entire season out of it. <laughs> sure, if you're them. <laughs> um, and we actually, uh, I don't know if I can. I'm sure I can tell you. There, um, we got a letter, an email from one of their producers, and one of their characters in the upcoming season of Orange is the New Black has a pretty prominent Archer tattoo on her tummy. And they said, so hey, she's kind of going to be a pretty prominent character, and we don't want to have to cover this tattoo up all the time. Is it okay? And we're like, that's going to be great. <laughs> so, and I think she might be um, Piper's love interest, actually, in this next season. Oh, so, wow. And they, you know, here's the photograph of it, and it was, it was pretty neat. Well, that means that in the world of Orange is New Black, Archer is Archer's a, a thing. Archer's a very popular show. Yeah. Which character? Uh, I don't know the character's name. The actress, her name's Ruby Oh, no, Rose. The, what character is tattooed? Oh, it's Archer. Oh, okay. Archer, like, peeking up out of the waistband of her underwear. <laughs> You'll see it if you want to. I think it's going to be on TV. Well, now everyone's going to rush out and get that exact same tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. We have, we do get emails from time to time of, like, I've seen Pam tattoos on human beings like this big. Like, like the whole back of the leg is Pam. Pam seems to have like a real following. I think she's, she's the fan favorite. Really? And Amber Nash, who does her voice, um, we live in Atlanta and the show's made in Atlanta. And Amber and Lucky are the only two actors based in Atlanta. But she's been in our shows since forever. And I just think she's the funniest person in the world. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah. think it mostly comes from, from, from her doing the voice? or? Yeah, and apparently that's, that's her mom's voice. Really? So she's just imitating her mom, and her mom hates it. <laughs> so Amber actually has sort of a, a deep, smoky voice, so she sounds nothing like Pam. That's just what she used to do to drive her mom nuts. Oh, I see. So it was her, originally her, her imitation of her mom. Yeah. How does her mom feel about Archer, then? Her mom? Yes. I, well, I'm sure she's happy for Amber. <laughs> like, my mom is happy for me, but they, my parents don't watch the show at all. It's not their thing. Um, and when it came out, like, they told all their friends to watch it, like, from church, and then that was all <laughs> thing. Like, at the church potluck dinner, they were like, oh, Adam's got a show. You guys should watch it. It's on Thursday. And then, like, I don't think they go to that church <laughs> They were kicked out of the church. So, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about the voice cast, and you, you've also had some amazing guest stars on the yes. show. And just not, not just amazing in terms of talent, but in terms of, oh How'd my... How'd you get them? Yeah. And, I mean, I guess, like, it's, it's, it's so cheap to say what's been your favorite experience, but what's the one that you thought would never happen and totally did happen? Burt Reynolds. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we normally, uh, we do everything over the phone because people don't fly to Atlanta just to do some voiceover. Sure. Because it's like $300. <laughs> um, <laughs> wouldn't even cover their plane ticket. Yeah. Um, so you paid, Bert, you paid Burt Reynolds $300? Like three sixty. I don't know. <laughs> Not a lot. He's a good get. Um, but we, act, we flew to Jupiter, Florida, where he lives, to meet him and, and do the whole thing. And he walked in. He was in all black. Hair perfect, super handsome, big kick-ass black truck out front with the little bandit logo on the door. You're, you're kidding. No. Black <laughs> boots. It was like the bandit walked into the room, and I was just just awestruck. And I was just like, la, 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 la. <laughs> And uh, he was fantastic and super nice. And then, you know, like afterwards, we're just talking in the parking lot, leaning next to his truck. And I was like... My head's going to explode all over Burt Reynolds. <laughs> so, yeah, he was wonderful. He signed my script. Oh, wow. I just totally fanboyed him. And, you know, I was like, hey, can you sir, tell me I was great to work with? 
I mean, was that something you, I mean, because I feel like Burt Reynolds came up as early as season one. I'm a huge fan of his from when I was a kid. I just, Burt Reynolds movies, if I could have just done that all the time, that's what I would have done. I'm curious about how you also got uh, Kenny Loggins on the show, because like, that's. He called us. <laughs> Kenny Loggins did not call us. Somebody that works for somebody that works for Kenny Loggins called us and said, hey, Kenny's a fan. <laughs> and Kenny would not say no to doing a little something for you guys. Really? And then we were like, well, let's write a whole episode where he's just a terrible human being. And, <laughs> and then he was okay with that. And that was, yeah, we've just been very, very lucky. Did, did Kenny Loggins really have no notes on the script? He, I, is he here? <laughs> he did have some notes uh, that we had not initially drawn him handsome enough. <laughs> so we actually went back and handsomed him up like 10%, and then he was like, eh, it's fine. That's he's actually very, very handsome. Yeah, he's Kenny Loggins. He's no Burt Reynolds, but he's pretty good looking. Well, like, let's not compare our apples and other fruit. And Burt Reynolds is. And <laughs> <laughs> Burt Reynolds is. Oh, can I ask one question of the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Is Stuart Prince here? Or John? Hey, Are I see you a there? Hand. Did you cut school? Okay. Thanks for coming. Hope you don't get expelled or whatever. <laughs> Hi, how you, I hung out with your dad last night. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm just confused because I, I thought school was usually over by four. Oh, what time is it? It's like. I don't know how they do it here. I don't yeah. know. They don't have cocaine at the dentist. <laughs> oh, goodness. People are getting drunk. Be careful. All right. If my mom was here, nobody would be able to move until she vacuumed and mopped. <laughs> well, what's, a, what's an archer panel without a party foul? Exactly. They're normally a, a lot, lot worse. And John Benjamin is sort of unleashed. He yeah, says you, some that, shocking okay. things. Yeah, Archer does a lot of live of live events and live yes, panels. Yes, yes. And I mean, but are they usually more like evening time? Like content wise? Yeah. Yeah, they'd be after midnight, but <laughs> like 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning, John Benjamin will just be in front of, you know, at Comic-Con, there's like little kids there and John is just working his super blue stuff. <laughs> right off the, and I blush so hard and it's, it, I just get the giggle so bad. Uh, but he's got a very... Uh, I don't know if confrontational is the right word, but he's, uh, he's not afraid to go the extra mile for at least to make himself laugh. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in Atlanta, and David Cross is from Atlanta, and the University of Georgia football team, it's like, you know, they take it very seriously, and their big rival is the University of Florida, and it's the biggest game of the year in the Southeast, and everybody's super serious about it, and also super drunk. And John and David Cross went to Athens, Georgia, in the main street. It's a college town. It's just bar after bar after bar. And everybody's wearing their jerseys. Everybody's drunk. I guess it would be like the Stanley Cup Finals. Jeez Louise. And they went from bar to bar. And in the middle of a crucial play, like the ball is in the air, is the guy going to catch it for a touchdown? John had a universal remote control in his pocket. <laughs> and would turn off all the televisions in the bar. And the bar would explode. And people were like literally throwing bottles at the bartenders. And then they're frantically trying to fix the satellite and they just turn it back on. And then they turn it off. And then they just went from bar to bar to bar. And I was like, John, you literally could have been killed. And he was like, it's the best feeling in the world. I thought we were gonna die. <laughs> That's like, that's a story that you should never tell whoever does the insurance on the show. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a loose cannon. He's a loose cannon. He also, our very first, the, like, Archer hadn't even aired yet in the big television critics thing in L.A. Uh -huh. um, John, John didn't want to come. And uh, he was like, I'm not going to that. And his agent said, you have to come. And he said, I'll come if they send a helicopter. <laughs> so the nice lady at FX Travel... <laughs> Got John Benjamin a helicopter <laughs> in Boston, where, where he's from. And he was like at a vacation at the beach. like So he's on Martha's Vineyard. And she's like, OK, so you have to drive across the island. And then this helicopter is going to meet you at the helipad and fly you to Logan. He was, he was like, they really did it. 
And then he was mortified that somebody had actually booked him a helicopter. So he made a whole scene about how it was a crappy helicopter and he wouldn't fly on that brand. I'll just drive. He's a dream to work with. <laughs> he sounds like. He's great. I hope he's not here. <laughs> well, I mean, it, that's the interesting thing is that you record, you, everything gets recorded individually. Like yes. you, work, <clears throat> you work with each individual actor on their own. They don't have any interaction with the others. No, we normally, uh, we're on the phone um, and either one of us will read the other parts with them. Okay. Um, but some people actually don't like that. Like, um, they, some people like to do it as a scene and, and feed off of you, but other people are just like, I'll give you three in a row mm -hmm. and move on. Which one is John Benjamin? Um, we, we, we've done it all kinds of ways with John. It's just whatever mood he's in. Sure. Um, so my, my follow-up on that was how do, you, how do you direct it? Like what's your pro process towards directing something when you're directing one person basically in one room and then like a week later directing someone in another? That all really depends on the actor. Um, and I guess we've learned, you learn pretty early on how they want to do it mm -hmm. and how they respond best to uh, your style of directing. And I think we tailor it to, to them. Um, so with some, it's just unconditional positive feedback. And uh, if we get to like five takes with Amber, she just stops and goes, read it to me how you want it. <laughs> um, and then you do, and she does it just like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, other, I didn't know this was uh, an incredibly rude thing to do in our very first uh, cartoon. Mm -hmm. I was doing that like, I want you to say it like this, and I would do the line read. And uh, Harry Goss, who was on this cartoon, Sea Lab, for Adult Swim, uh, after a long, grueling session, he's like a super famous Broadway actor. He pulled me aside, he was like, that was fun, just quick note, that's incredibly rude what you did all day. Please don't ever do it again, and I was just mortified. So then you had to figure out a new way to get them to say it how you wanted. My new way was, please do it however you want, and we'll do one safety, and then that's it. So, yeah, they know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing of it. Like, you cast, you, you, ha you pack your cast with talent, and they yes. tend to show up and perform. Yes, yes. So it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. They're, they, they, they're pros. They're great. Yeah. How are we on time right now? Uh, so how many more minutes? Okay, fantastic. We can keep talking about all sorts of things. Um, so, I mean, looking back over this, the, the course of the show, how hard is it to kind of, we talked about like, you know, you don't try to keep track of where we are in history, <laughs> where we are in the world, but how hard, how hard do you try to keep track of like, you know, just remembering, you know, bringing in things that happened in season two, like the cancer and making sure that, you know, you can look at the course of the show and technically you're saying ridiculous things, but it, there is some sort of logic and sense to what in, happened. In that universe, yeah, there is a, a, a bit of logic and a, and a continuity and we have, um, uh, in this season, Archer uh, hooks back up with a couple of uh, uh, people from the past, like Barry comes back, and um, uh, a guy named Conway Stern, who's played by this actor, Kobe Bell, comes back. Some fans of them. So yeah, they, um, they were both great. Um, Dave Willis, who plays Barry, is the creator of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also based in Atlanta. Um, and he's great to work with. So they come back, and it's... The problem we run into is, is like I'd like to have every guest star back all the time, mm -hmm. you know, because they have such a good time working with them, and we've been lucky enough that just our favorite people now we can call them and say, "Hey, would you like to come do this?" Or you know, "Hey, would you like three hundred dollars?" Who doesn't want three hundred dollars? How often do you lead with three hundred dollars versus, "Hey, you want to come have?" That's the first thing. <laughs> That's the first thing they want to know is how many hundred dollars is it, and it's three. Um, <laughs> like, I'm a huge fan of Camille Nanjani, and so we like wrote a script just especially for him, and then uh, that was sort of the calling card, like, I hope you do this, because it's basically all about you. Um, and he's he was a, just wonderful. He's a very specific brand. He is a very specific brand. So it would be hard to find someone else to do that episode. Exactly. Exactly. I sh we should have asked first. How often do you ask first, and how often do you write first? I'd say most of the time we write first and then talk about who would be uh, good for that role. But and then you know I like Burr Reynolds, mm -hmm. 
wrote that first. Really? So you, you, yeah. you, you really went on that limb? Yeah, um, because uh, yeah, I felt like we had to. But he actually, he had a lot of notes. And he called me on the telephone, which was amazing. <laughs> how, does, how does he, does he just call up and say, hi, Adam, this is Bert? Hey, it's Bert Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> um, but his notes were like, uh, the original script was all about how amazing Bert Reynolds was. Uh -huh. And he just kept doing all this amazing stuff. And he was like, uh, it makes me seem like kind of a dick. <laughs> what if we made fun of me? And I was like, we can do that. <laughs> If you're cool with it. So uh, uh, his notes were all like sort of taking the wind out of the Burt Reynolds mythos. That's, I mean, is, was, was that a surprise for you? Yeah, because if I were Burt Reynolds, I'd be insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> He's 80 years old and he is handsomer than anybody probably in this whole building. <laughs> yeah. He's super handsome. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. So for, I mean, I, is it, who who is who's so now that you've you've gotten you've locked down Bert? Yep. Who, what's the next level? Who's who's the next big get? Probably Redford, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next big get, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I hate to say this, but there's no way we're ever going to top Bert Reynolds. Um, and Bert Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> it was a trick this whole uh, time. You know, we had, um, oh my God, Brian Cranston. We've uh, had John Hamm, and there it's just crazy. It's it's like, well, call them and see see what happens. And they're like, yeah, I'll do it. Everyone likes three hundred dollars. Yeah, everybody likes three hundred dollars. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, imagine how how long would you say you know when how long would you say Burt Reynolds took to you know full you know, literally twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> twenty minutes to record all of his dialogue. Yeah, it 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 doesn't take long. You know, it's it's not a tough job. Not to take away from what they do but like I don't think physically it's a very demanding job there's always like a big thing of drinks and snacks and it's it's lovely and there's somebody to fetch you tea and everything mm -hmm. um, I think being a VO actor is actually a pretty great gig well it's interesting too because there's there's a bit of a thing I don't know of how m much drama it is in the long run, but I know some, there's there are some act some, some voiceover actors who are not thrilled necessarily about the fact that you know, they did this thing all the time, and then in the last two decades or so, more and more, you know, people with famous faces are starting to come in. They actually hate it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they, like, pro, you know, I've always just done VO, mm -hmm. and they're great to work with, but if you're like, oh, and then we're having Camille on Johnny on. Oh, yeah, on air. Yeah. <laughs> on is, that, is that their name for them, the on air? The on camera. On camera. Camera face guy. <laughs> Um, yeah, they, they, I don't, yeah, they don't, they don't care for them. Now, how did, is, your, your cast, though, leans more heavily towards the on-camera folk. Oh, yeah, they're all, uh, yeah, I don't think we have any just, just voiceover. We do as, as guest stars, because they can come in and do, like, what do you want? You want a Russian colonel, and then I'll do this Argentinian dude, and then I'll do this little kid, and then I'll do a lady, and it's like, great. You're getting great value out of your $300. <laughs> Yeah, and they do up to three separate voices for the same money, so you can really screw those guys. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I can't see why they'd have any any, any <laughs> issue whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, is is that something you see coming to a head at any point? No. Yeah. No. Um, and a lot of, uh, I think probably every actor now they have an on camera agent and also a VO agent, and they're two separate, sometimes two separate agencies. Mm -hmm. And one's just booking them. VO stuff, and they what every one of them says uh, is they love it because they don't have to shower, or you know they come in in sweatpants and a tank top and just knock it out and then go to the gym or whatever. It is fascinating how many actors seem to hate bathing. <laughs> the first thing, do I have to shower? No, just come on in, dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of the voiceover talent, who's who's like a great you know, voiceover only person you've worked with who, you know, you don't feel like gets the attention they deserve? Hmm. Uh, we, uh, hmm. That's a great question. This guy, uh, Bill. This guy, Bill? Yeah, he's great. He's great. A guy named Bill. Oh, oh you meant Bill. Bill, Bill. Right. Bill, the VO guy. A guy named Bill Lobley that we've worked with a bunch of times can do anything, mm -hmm. any voice. Um, yeah, he's great. Is Bill here? 
Bill's okay to be here. Yeah, I uh, love Bill. Okay. What else do you have? I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, absolutely. We can do that. We can do that. Can you talk? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Can you talk about, uh, you know, when the genesis for the idea came and then how you presented it to FX and, you know, maybe what the time period was between that or was it just like a, a flash or did they approach you? Did it start with one character? Um, my, um, our last show on Adult Swim had been canceled and I sort of, um, I wouldn't say a breakdown, but I sort of freaked out a little bit and, uh, like rented out my house and then just was gonna walk the earth like Cain for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I had just gotten these agents and that was not their plan at all for me because that doesn't pay them much. So I was like in Tarifa in Spain and had been dodging their emails for like eight months and they're like, we really need you to come back to America and do some work or we're gonna fire you. So what do you have? And I had been just like walking all over Europe and North Africa and jotting down notes and um, thinking a lot about the spy fiction genre and James Bond in particular. And somebody had given me a long time ago a set of, uh, like a match set of all the James Bond paperbacks up through whatever. They were from the 60s and 70s. And those books are super dark. Like, the James Bond in those books is not really a nice human being. So I was trying to think of a way, you know, to make that funny in, in, a, in a character that was just basically a total bastard, but that you would still root for. And that was sort of the genesis of it. And then watching, I came back to America and was doing research and watched the, like the first reboot of James Bond with uh, Judy Dench as M and stole that, but made her the mom. But the whole process, like, I think it was very quick. I came back, I think I went out in October to pitch, and by, like, January 1st, we were making the pilot. So it was, ve it was too fast, and it was a very stressful, <laughs> stressful time. But it was, it was, it, when it happened, it happened very quickly. Did that pilot go straight to air, or did you, was it a test pilot that you then developed further on? No, that ended up, well... It was sort of mother hand a lot, and there were some revisions and some focus groups, um, a lot. But that that did end up, you know, ninety percent going going right to air. That's great. So that's because that's not very common in animation, is it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But so I think from the time like okay, here I have this idea to Archer's now on television was a year, which I think is pretty fast. Got some uh, down, uh, down. We got a question down here up front. Oh, uh, so, oh okay. Sorry. Oh, right over here. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, Amro Mazub. I'm a producer as well here in Vancouver. I have a question for you because you touched on this a little bit with working with studios, and you have a great executive you go back and forth with. But what do you have for advice for someone? They don't tell you that the marketing aspect of your idea is probably where you do the most work, and. What was it that you came to the point where like, okay, I can trust this studio with my idea? Where was that, can you recall that moment where you were like, they get it, and I don't have to keep pressing? You know, uh, well with, with, we pitched to a lot of networks, and um, some of them were just, I don't know why we were there, because it was obviously gonna be a bad fit. Like ABC Family, I pitched to them. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, like six people just like, and, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, he's a porn fetish, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but with FX, like right in the, in the pitch meeting, you know, they were all leaning forward and like, well, is it going to be, you know, more grounded in reality? Or do you see like, is there going to be like a weather machine villain or any of you? So they were right off the bat really engaged. And that was, that was very comforting. And also, um, before I started working with them, I was a fan of a lot of their shows. Like, I watch them, you know, I, I download them and pay for them. I, I really was a big fan. So I think that, that was a big part of it, knowing what they had already done. Not to dump on ABC Family, I'm sure they have some great shows too. I think it would have been a great fit. <laughs> like Archer Babies, where they're just <laughs> little, little kids solving you, mysteries. You could do that episode. 
<laughs> okay. Email me that. All right. Uh, speaking of babies, will we see any more of Archer's other child? The yes, baby, baby Seamus will be in this season. Yeah. Um, he's about, uh, he's a toddler now. I think he's like three or four. Um, not to ruin the joke, but he looks like a two foot tall Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got little horn rim glasses, and we're actually even going to gray his temples, even though he's just four years old. And he's wearing a little sweater and shorts. So. Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, I really love the show because on one hand you have all these great jokes and all this meta stuff, but on the other, other hand it's like savagely violent. <laughs> so like, <laughs> It's pretty violent. Yeah. Like I was wondering, like the fight scenes are really elaborate and very like filmic. Do you like come up with that stuff or do you work with your animators on like choreography? I don't do any of that. I just say fight scene. <laughs> And then I will like a lot of times there'll be a lot of dialogue going on while the fight's going on, like to you know give them something to do, and I'll just say fight scene and then write all my dialogue and then come in and watch the cut and go wow, <laughs> yeah that was great. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the studio that does the actual animation? Uh yeah we do that. Okay. Uh we make it, we make it in Atlanta. The company's Floyd County. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about. Um, there's about a hundred of us now, but not everybody's working on Archer. We're always, uh, we've been really trying to come up with another show that FX likes to air with Archer. We haven't nailed it yet, mm -hmm. but I th uh, probably 45 people work on Archer full time, and we do everything in Atlanta. Just you walk around your entire worlds there. Yeah. Except, yeah. except for the actors. Please. Except for the actors. So yeah, we call them on the phone, but everything else is done. Uh, in house in Atlanta, and they we use um, I don't know if there are animation people here, but uh, through uh, just a random unfortunate events, we wouldn't do it like this now. But Archer is made in uh, Illustrator and After Effects is all the animation, and it's the most cumbersome, <laughs> ungainly way to make a cartoon. But it's too late to change now. We had a question right here. Yeah, so could you talk a little bit about your work with on Chosen and why like you know Chosen isn't the next Archer? Like that's maybe my favorite. And I was like, man. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think the ratings obviously weren't good enough for it to stay on, um, and I don't, I don't know wh why it didn't click. Uh, there are some great, uh, some great actors on the show. Michael Pena was was great, and Bobby Moynihan was wonderful. Um, so you know, I I don't know why stuff we we've, we've done. We've done a lot of shows for them that don't make it past the focus group, or or just they will uh, see something that we've done and go, yeah, this was funnier when you talked about it. <laughs> We're not going to do this. <laughs> so I don't know. I just think it's uh, it's sort of a fluke, I guess. I I feel when something hits, you know, with, for whatever reason, some unquantifiable thing. I don't know, but we really hope that that would stay, be on TV. Is there another heartbreaker of a uh, another heartbreaker show that didn't make it? Uh, I yes yes there is um, my big 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 idea um, for FX as the Archer companion show was set in 1720s England. Sure. And it was about two highwaymen who lived over a brothel and they just robbed people, <laughs> and all the actors were English and. It, they had horses, the whole 1720s, and I was like, guys, this is going to be great. We're going to be talking about the South Sea bubble and, and personal debt and, and, and transvestitism, which was a big thing back then. And they were like, no, 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 we don't want that at all. And I was like, <laughs> this is what we're doing. <laughs> so I wrote the script, and I was so excited about it, and we had great talent lined up, like Stephen Merchant, uh, Don French, we had some amazing, amazing talent, and FX was like, we really, really, really are not going to put this on television. <laughs> so no matter how much work you do on it, it's you're not going to be able to watch it on TV. So that was kind of heartbreaking. I'm sorry. What was it called? King's Road. King's Road, and it was set in the in the village, I think, of Fapping Wood. <laughs> So yeah, obviously very highbrow stuff. Um, you could show that in a history class. Yeah, 
And the, the, the animators were excited about it. It was beautiful. We didn't animate it, but we did all the, the character artwork. It was just beautiful. Um, it was one of those, I wrote, the, I wrote the pilot in like two and a half days. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't type fast enough. It would just, um, so yeah, that was, that was like a real gut punch. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, oh, for, for one for two. That's yeah. not bad. 500 ball. Exactly. Uh, are we have yeah, hi. Uh, there's this little skirmish going on, I guess, in the Middle East. And did that uh, affect what happened with ISIS and maybe merchandising? Uh, yeah, I don't think that stuff's selling like it did. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a thing that uh, sort of coincided with the end of season five and during our break while writing season, starting to write season six. It became more and more of a thing, and my what I do with every problem is ignore it and hope it goes away. <laughs> and FX kept saying, "What's your plan for this?" And I said, "My plan is to ignore it and hope it goes away," <laughs> which has served me very well in the past. Um, and it didn't. Uh, so what we have sort of done, um, we and we very rarely talk about super scary real world things on Archer. It's always, you know, a bit of a, a goof of a thing. You know, there's never really a, a terror component to what they do. Uh, it was a big reason why we started off with the KGB because at the time we were totally buddies with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and lo probably a little less now, which I think we caused. <laughs> Archer. Archer caused it. Not America, but yeah. Archer. Um, so then they said, look, this is really not going away. So actually, this cut that y'all saw, um, it, there used to be ISIS logos everywhere. And we've actually gone back and taken the ISIS logos out. And we don't really talk about ISIS anymore. And it coincided with, uh, well, now we're going to start doing some work for the CIA, uh, another, a faultless organization. <laughs> <laughs> Never uh, in the news. We actually sort of dump on the CIA pretty frequently on the show. I hope that doesn't come back to harm me personally. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, we have just sort of, without discussing it in the show, we've just sort of drifted away from talking about ISIS or any of that. Is there, is there, is there any way or any... What, what, is there any reason or way that you would consider going back and f altering previous seasons, or is that off no, the table? No, no. I think, I think, yeah, no. That's that's all out there. And I, I really like. What I was telling Liz earlier, like whenever o Obama says ISIL, I'm like, yeah, keep getting that out. There. <laughs> but um, yeah, we have actually. We've gone back and um, we painted out some some of the logos, and it's not. We but won't for, be for, using, for, for what's com coming. For up. what's coming up now, yeah. Are we on questions? Uh, Adam, thank you so much for making the show. I, I love the show. I think it's hilarious. Um, thank you. Wanted to ask about uh, your decision to go uh, Archer Vice direction. Um, that I was, I was, I was personally worried that people were bored, and I thought, let's let's do some cocaine. Let's <laughs> give these people cocaine. Let's get all the dentists in here and give everybody cocaine. <laughs> um, but. Somebody mentioned violence earlier. Uh, like, I don't even know what the body count is on Archer. There are like literally scores of people have been killed. But what we were very conscious of, when they started becoming uh, drug dealers, from that moment on, they never killed anybody. Hmm. And nobody's ever mentioned that. Uh, so I think like this guy Brett got killed in the first episode, and then some bad guys would kill people, but the Archer gang never killed anybody. And so now that they're back, I guess, on the good side of the law, they're just, you know, they're killing people left and right again. Why, why did you feel that they, couldn't, they, could, they, could be drug, they could be secret agents and kill people, but they couldn't be drug dealers and kill people? It's too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. Um, yeah, it's like, like the hooker with a heart of gold. You know, sure. it's like drug dealer, nonviolent drug dealer. Um, and it seems like, actually, I don't know if this is um, certainly not conscious, but it seems like, they are killing fewer people on Archer now. In season one, it was just like, they were like the plague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, hey. Um, just wanted to know, what is your writing process for Archer, and has it changed over the seasons? Uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't really changed. Um, I write, I just, 
probably 98% of the stuff myself. We don't have a writer's room. Uh, so it's just like me at my kitchen table most of the time, sometimes at the office, um, just pacing back and forth in front of the computer and then I'll sit down and type in a burst and then pace around some more. Um, just drinking coffee in the daytime and then at some point later, whiskey. <laughs> Next question? Oh, yeah. I don't Hello. know if we have any more. Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, so I just, uh, you guys push a lot of boundaries, uh, joke-wise. Have you ever said that now we have gone too far, or is there any line where you stop? Um, I, th I think I personally self-edit stuff because on some level I'm worried that my mom will see it, you know, like even though I know she never will. Uh, <laughs> unless she was like a clockwork orange and somebody strapped her in a chair with her eyes propped open. <laughs> and I don't know, if, you know, I grew up in a small southern town, that all probably informs it, so there are some things that I that pop into my head when I'm writing something where I'm like, ugh, can't put that in there. And a lot of it, you know, I know what can and can't go on television. So I think it, the self-editing happens before, you know, we waste any money animating it or recording it or whatever. And FX is pretty good about letting you know what you can and can't do. But what they, Cartoon Network had a list, like, here's a memo and here are the words that you can't say and there were a bunch of them. It wasn't the seven George Carlin words, there was a bunch of words. Uh, FX just says, uh, well, we know it when we see it. So, but now we, we kind of know. And there's some that you legally can't say on television. Like How butts. <laughs> <laughs> How many uh, shits and fucks do you get in the season? None. Really? N we is we can we could say shit all day long, but we can't say fuck. Okay. Um, and FX actually has a policy, apparently just for us, because Family Guy and Always Sunny get to do it. <laughs> uh, but we have the same. FX is part of Fox, so a lot of times there are Fox people that work on FX shows, and the S and P lady, for some reason. She's gone now, actually. But she wouldn't let Archer beep anything out. Like, we couldn't even beep a cuss word. Mm -hmm. Whereas other shows would get to beep cuss words. But that was another argument that didn't go anywhere. I was like, the Sunny guys could beep stuff. She didn't care. Is Darlene here? <laughs> <laughs> just, just for this. Just to be here. <laughs> just to make sure I don't swear. <laughs> Next question. Uh, in the first season of Archer Vice, I mean, the first episode, you kind of showed the rest of it in the montage. Yes. And I thought that was kind of spoilery. Why did you do that? Um, well, we had already paid for the song was one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then a lot of it, because, uh, you know, normally with a trailer, you have the movie to work off of and can you use stuff that you've already shot. But we hadn't done any of it yet, and it just said montage. And I didn't know what was going to happen in the season. So I, there's some stuff in there that did happen, but there's a lot of stuff that didn't happen. Um, just because I hadn't, I'm not one of those writers that has it all plotted out on index cards beforehand. I'm the kind of writer that goes, oh my God, I have a script due tomorrow. Put on the coffee and whiskey. So you didn't boil that montage down from the finished stuff? Then. Oh no, a lot of it was totally made up. So if it was, if any of it was spoilery, Total accident. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> See, next question. Hey, um, thanks for coming. Thank uh, you. Lana is one of my favorite uh, characters on the show. I, I really uh, find I, I end up sympathizing with her more than anybody else. And uh, I just wondered if you'd share any uh, the, the casting and working with Aisha and what that's like. She's great. <laughs> she is great. Um, that was one of the, the things when, uh, when we sent out the casting call uh, for Archer um, and we said we were describing Mallory's character and there was a short paragraph and then we said think Jessica Walter in Arrested Development and the next day her agent called and said I have the actual Jessica Walter <laughs> if that would interest you and I was like <laughs> yes that would interest me let me call you right back and then breathe into a paper bag. <laughs> and then we just stopped everything and sat down, you know, our, back then there were just like five people. And we said, 
pick who who are all the people that you would like to have on the show, and let's go call them now and drop her name and say she's already attached. So it went from let's see who agrees to do this, who wants three hundred bucks, <laughs> um, to now. You know who's great is Aisha Tyler's great. What about Chris Parnell, Judy Greer, John Benjamin? And then called them and we said, so Jessica Walter is attached to this. She's playing this very important character. And she said, very fond of you and like to work with you if you're interested. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then all these people agreed to it. So that it, it's all because of Jessica Walter. Um, are we, how are you doing? We're out of time. What? Can I can I can I ask one final question? Of course. All right. Uh, looking, you know, in, in your dotage, in thirty years from now, looking back on Archer, what would you like to think the legacy of the show have, was? <laughs> <laughs> um, man, the legacy the legacy of laughter. You know, um, God, I don't know. I just feel so fortunate to to get to do this job. And I've, this may sound a little corny, but whatever. I've made some really great friends, and I'm, you know, now friendly w with most of these actors. Um, and relationships like at FX and all the great animators that we get to work with every day, it's a fun place to work. So selfishly, like, at least, you know, the main thing for me is that I've had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't know when I think about it compared to other shows. Like, I don't think about it like, as a real TV show, you mm -hmm. know, I just when like when I see evidence of it as a real TV show, I'm like, oh my god, that's right. Like you see uh, like Archer on a billboard, I'm like, that's right, <laughs> that's right. So I don't know. It just it, it's nice. It'd be nice to be remembered. Yeah, and you got to meet Burt Reynolds. Totally met Burt Reynolds. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.